Today we're going to cover some concepts of chapter 12 social psychology in our intro to psychology class, talking about the self and how we go about um, developing our self-concept and figuring out who we are. So it turns out that social contact is absolutely crucial to the development of our self-concept. We really need other people to um, properly understand ourselves. And so we've learned through different experiments that if you raise, for example, a chimpanzee in isolation versus with a normal family group, that their sense of self is, is impacted by this. And so one thing that you can do to test to see if a baby or an animal has a sense of self is something we call the mirror test. So you can take a baby and you can put a sticker or a mark on their forehead and put them in front of a mirror. And if you put them in the mirror and they look on the, at their reflection and they see another baby, meaning that they don't see themselves in the reflection, then they might, you know, look at the baby, make a comment, ooh, baby, or something like that. They won't actually... Um, notice the dot on their head or realize that it's actually on their head. However, for babies who understand themselves and that they're separate from other people, when you put them in front of the mirror, they recognize themselves, they identify who they are, and they will touch the dot on their own head. And that signals that they know that they're looking at themselves and that the dot doesn't belong. And you can actually test this on different animals. For example, dolphins and elephants have sense of self and can identify themselves in the mirror and know that something is different with their appearance. This study has also been done with chimpanzees. And it turns out that if you take chimpanzees and you raise them in normal family social um, groupings, those chimpanzees actually do pass the mirror test. When you have chimpanzees who are raised in isolation, they do not pass the mirror test, which suggests that they have not developed a sense of self. So we really need others to properly understand ourselves. We often use other people to define ourselves and we use it to compare our abilities, uh, how well we're doing at something. For example, if we play, play basketball, we tend to uh, compare our abilities to others. So if we're making three-point shots and we're making every single one, we might ask ourselves, are we really good at this um, or is this normal? So you would then have a friend come and make a bunch of three-point shots. And if the friend cannot make those shots, then you would come to the conclusion that you're really good at this. Also, we can use others to define ourselves in terms of attitudes where we um, adjust how we feel about certain um, things running from how we feel about uh, a genre of music to uh, how we feel about um, politics. And so we're going to continue with this idea that we compare ourselves to others in order to better understand ourselves. And we refer to this as social comparison theory. So this is the idea that we learn about our own abilities, our own attitudes, by comparing ourselves with other people. And it revolves around the idea that we have to figure out when we engage in social comparison. Um, so for example, when we have no objective standard that exists to measure against, we don't understand um, what good or bad is. So if you make a 75 on a test, you might say, well, is this a good grade or a bad grade? So you might actually compare yourself to a classmate and say, hey, what did you make on this test? And if they say, well, I made a 12, then a 75 is good. And so you have a, now you have a standard to go by. Or if you made a 75 and somebody made 125, then maybe the 75 isn't so good. So we tend to engage when, in, um, in social comparison when we don't have a standard or when we're uncertain about something. Um, so if we you know, start a new job and they ask us what retirement plan we want and we have no idea what to, what to choose from, then we tend to engage in social comparison to then um, educate us and to help alleviate some of that uncertainty. Now, 
we also have the question in terms of social comparison theory, with whom do we compare ourselves to? And it turns out that in, when we are comparing ourselves, usually it's a completely initial impulse. Anyone who's around is someone that you can compare yourself to. It occurs really quickly and automatically and something that you engage in pretty uh, pretty instantaneously. So let's say you're in a Spanish class and you're wondering how you'll probably do in the class and what your ability level is. So you might notice that a student goes up and speaks to the professor and is just speaking really good Spanish. And so you would then, um, you know, that's an instant comparison. That's something that you are going to do without really ever really thinking about it. You go, oh, wow, I know no Spanish at all. And so you want to uh, be careful about these really quick initial impulses because sometimes it can lead to you feeling very doubtful about yourself. So to be more accurate, you would want to compare yourself to someone who has a background similar to yours. Maybe someone who's never taken a Spanish class, whereas that person sounds like they have some experience that does not match yours. So you would engage in comparison usually very quickly, um, very automatically, but then you can also engage in very thoughtful comparison depending on what you're trying to get out of the situation. Now, this is a really interesting picture here. On the left is Sophia Loren. She's an Italian actress and she's a singer, or she was a singer, um, very popular in the 1970s and 60s. This picture was actually taken in 1957. And on the right is Jane Mansfield. And if you look, uh, she's a, a sort of one of the first play, a Playboy Playmates. She's an American actress and singer, also very popular in the 50s and 60s. And so when you first look at this picture, you might see a social comparison taking place. It looks like Sophia Loren is eyeing Jane Mansfield's cleavage. She might feel inadequate. She might feel, wow, look at her cleavage out there. Um, and so this might be a really good example of social comparison happening in the moment. You know, you wonder what's going through her head and the comparisons that she's making from her body to the person next to her. So we can do it based on looks. We can do it based on abilities, based on attitudes, all sorts of things. Turns out that over a half a century after this picture, Sophia Loren told Entertainment Weekly that what exactly she was thinking, because this is a pretty iconic picture. And she said, I'm staring at her nipples because I'm afraid they are about to come onto my plate. And she added, in my face, you can see the fear. I am so frightened that everything in her dress is going to blow, boom, and spill all over the table. And while that's kind of a funny way to look at things, it does look like that at some point she's at least doing some sort of comparison here, even if she is fearful that she's about, her friend is about to bust out of her dress. Now, <clears throat> depending on your goal in this situation, um, will depend on with whom you engage in comparing yourself with. So if your goal is to know the first furthest level to which you can aspire, if you want to see the best that you can be and how good could you possibly be, you would engage in upward social comparison where you would compare yourself to people who are better at a, um, on a particular ability. So for example, if you play basketball, you might compare yourself to a professional in the sport uh, to say, I could get to this level and I could play to this level. Now, some positive effects of upward social comparison is that it gives you hope and inspiration. I can aspire to be like this person. But it does also lead to some negative effects. For example, you can feel dissatisfied with yourself or even envious of other people. So <clears throat> when you want to engage in making yourself feel better, when your goal is not to know the furthest level you can aspire, but you want to feel better about yourself, then you're likely going to engage, engage in social comparison, a downward social comparison, where you compare yourself to a person who's worse on a particular trait or ability. And so in that case, you look down on the person and say, well, at least I'm better than this person. Okay. And so some positive effects is, of course, you can feel some gratitude. Well, at least, you know, I'm better in this, or I did better on this test. I feel good about myself. But some neg negative effects is, of course, you can experience scorn, and this can kind of lead to some feelings of superiority. So we have to be careful when engaging in um, social comparison, uh, but we have to consider the goal of which why we engage in the comparison to begin with.
And so the goal is going to determine who we turn to to make that very explicit comparison. Now, we often tune into other people to, um, for, for different reasons to adopt other viewpoints, to um, look at different circumstances. So there's this idea of the looking glass self where we see ourselves in the social world through the eyes of other people. And we uh, ponder upon how they feel about us and how um, people react to us. <laughs> now, we often engage in tuning ourselves to other people when we want to get along with them. So we find that there are situations, for example, you have a friend and that friend is starting to date somebody with, and you would want to get along with their significant other. Or perhaps you are dating somebody and you want to be friendly with their parents and you want their parents to like you. Or maybe you're trying to get along with a roommate because you're going to have to live with them for a while. And so what we end up doing is we end up adopting people's viewpoints, we adopt their likes and dislikes if we want to get along with them, especially if we find that that person is likable, then we're going to be more likely to want to adopt their viewpoints and their and their likes and dislikes. We might choose to listen to their genre of music, watch their TV shows, we might even adopt their political opinion. Now you can also see the opposite effect occur, which is when we dislike someone because it's someone we don't like. So we dislike something because it's someone we don't like. So for example, um, if there's a person that you don't particularly care for and that person um, really loves to watch, you know, um, a particular TV show like The Bachelor. You might decide, well, I hate The Bachelor because so-and-so likes to watch it. Um, or the reverse of that. You know, they may say, well, I hate The Bachelor. And you say, well, I love The Bachelor because I want to watch it. So if a person is, you deem either unlikable or you don't want to like them or you don't like them, then we can actually see you reject certain um, attitudes because of this. Now, so when we are considering, um, when we're in the process of adopting other people's attitudes, we tend to do so and engage in social tuning when we want the person to either like us or we want to be accepted by them. And so the likability of the person also factors in and it explains why sometimes we tolerate really poor behavior on a friend or a family member because maybe the, the person is likable, but they... Um, have opinions about things that you don't agree with. And so sometimes we do kind of tune in and we take things more lightly. We may not completely adopt their opinion or attitude, but we are more, we're more sensitive to it and we don't necessarily um, outwardly say anything to the person. Um, so when we have situations where we want the person to like us, okay, when we like the person, we want to be accepted, we're going to spend time with the person and we want involvement, we tend to adopt some of their likes, dislikes, and attitudes. Now, like I said before, we can also reject the person's attitude if we deem them as unlikable or if we simply are not a fan of that person. And the last slide I have here is something that I feel like happens to a lot of people. When someone you don't like does something like make a joke, you tend to not laugh at that joke. Whereas if a friend of yours had made the same exact joke, you would have thought it was funny. So we, we become less tolerant of people that we find unlikable and we don't respond to them the same way that we would with somebody that we are friends with or want to get along with um, in whatever situation. So... Important things to consider is when do we engage in social comparison? We need other people in order to build our sense of self. And with whom do we compare each other to? And so these concepts are those that, that really focus in um, with social comparison theory. So if you have any questions, please feel free to email me or talk with me. And thank you very much for your attention.